Hi, and thanks for joining us again today. Um, my name is Saab Johal. I've worked as a psychologist for over 30 years now, and I've been a clinician for 16 of those. You can find out more about me if you click my LinkedIn profile. And welcome again to my special guest collaborator on this series of videos on self-leadership, um, Julie Trainer. How are you today, Julie? I'm good. I'm good on this bright and sunny morning. So uh, thrilled to be here. I really enjoyed our last conversation. So I'm looking forward to diving into this one too. Yeah, me too. And I've had some interesting feedback on it. So it'll be interesting to see what we get on this one. Um, so let's get straight into it. Uh, our second discussion in this series. Um, I came across an interesting article in the Atlantic magazine. And it was called Your Professional Decline is Coming Much Sooner Than You Think. Here's How to Make the Most of It by Arthur C. Brooks, which had an interesting interesting picture accompanying it. And I'll put that so you can see it now if you're watching. Uh, it's a man on a series of steps coming to a peak at age 50 and then a steep decline down to steps 60 and 70. And I think that resonated with me because I turned 50 not long ago. So it really was very meaningful for me. And the piece opens up with uh, the author wondering, whether or not they could keep up with what they felt had been a manic pace in their career. But what they also saw was it was going to be inevitable at some point in their career that the pace would slow down and even stop. And they were left asking themselves a question, what then? Was there anything that they could do now, at age 51 the author was, to give themselves a shot of avoiding the misery that the author overheard someone else expressing in the seat behind them on an aeroplane. I think we've all been in that sort of similar situation. You hear somebody else and you think, oh, yeah, that sounds familiar. And I thought that was interesting because a lot of the advice that we get, that we read about, that we watch, that we come across is about coping with withstanding, coping with withstanding the pressures as the pace ramps up. But what happens when it's all over or things slow down or if we ourselves slow down, which is what this article argues happens earlier than we think it might do. What do you think about that, Julie? You, you've read the article too. Yeah, I have. And also I'm a little sensitive uh, to the age uh, suggestion in this, uh, this article as well, having um, passed through the 50 mark. So I feel like I, uh, um, I had to read this article two or three times, actually, because I think it was that sensitivity about age and where I am personally. But yeah, I think the fascinating thing for me was that, um, yeah, we're always prepped to go, 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 perform really well, but what do we do when things are changing? And I think from a personal leadership point of view, it's those transitions that we have to be most aware with, aware about, and what do we do? And in this case, he was talking about what happens when you get older. Uh, but I think it applies as well as we just kind of continue in our professional career. But yeah, the the gravitational forces, the thing that stuck in my mind, having read through all the articles, and he talked about uh, professional gravitation, but I think he saw it as something that was drawing down, but actually I think it's really uh, recognising that as humans, we change over time, and it's how do we deal with those changes and those transitions? So yeah, I thought it was really fascinating, if a little hard to read at times. Yeah, it's quite dense, and you have to kind of pull it apart, but it's interesting around those transitions and stages, yeah? So one of the things that um, stood out to me in the beginning of the art school was him mapping out this idea that happiness for most adults tends to bottom out at uh, pe in people's 30s and 40s, and then starts going up again in their 50s, which is great news. Now, that could be for many reasons, such as bringing up children, which tends to happen in the 30s and 40s. Most people kind of like, that's the child rearing sort of period in their lives. But there was another interesting change when people get to age 70, which is where things get less predictable. So many stay steady in their increasing happiness, whereas others, men in particular, he singled out, see their happiness plummet. And one of the interesting things that he kind of like found out here was that achievement early on in your life doesn't necessarily protect you against unhappiness later on. And maybe that was about creating an, un, an early template of unrealistic expectations for success. And we're not sure, but it seems that the waning or tailing off of ability for people who have had high achievement or high accomplishment in their lives is especially brutal, psychologically speaking. Any thoughts on that? 
Yeah, well, I think it's for sure a um, couple of things that sprung to mind, one of which is these stages of happiness and the fact that, um, you know, happiness might kind of bottom out in the, the uh, middle age, if you like. I mean, it's the kind of classic, you know, um, we all hear about midlife crises. And I think that's, you know, it's that awakening to hang on a minute here. What's going on? Um, how happy am I? What, and I think sometimes, it, you know, from my own experience and people I work with is that, in those early years, you're 34, you're just, it's all consuming. Life is totally mm -hmm. all consuming. You've got kids, you've got work, particularly if you're, um, you know, climbing in a professional career. And all of a sudden, uh, you kind of look up and say, well, what's going on here? And then as that pushes through, as you get older, um, those questions, and I think he talked about it in the article, is that it's not just about your own happiness, or rather, where does happiness come from is probably a better way of putting it, mm. is... Um, you know, does it come from uh, your professional status? And you, know, you hear things talked about, you know, fame, fortune and status. And I think that um, as you get older and your professional career goes on, um, you know, maybe some of those things ebb away. So your performance uh, definitely will drop off because it's just a biological fact that you're not going to think quite as, um, as quickly and you think in different ways. Uh, but also the fact that... Um, you know, physically, there's a lot going on, but emotionally, um, we, we're just not prepared to deal with it, which is why the psychological thing starts to kick in, because we start to read uh, more meaning into the psychological, uh, sorry, the emotional kind of feelings that we, we get. And therefore, then I think it probably affects, um, you know, our mental health generally, which is why uh, it talks about it. And I, th I think it does seem to be worse for men than women as they get older. Mm. Post 70, yeah. Not quite sure what that's about. You might know better than me. Not there yet. I'll let you know. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it is interesting, isn't it? Um, about this kind of idea that you know it, it becomes a mystery to people. They, they they haven't had to deal with this before in their lives. They're high, used to high accomplishment. They they set high standards for themselves, and they've met them. And something might happen, and it happens later on in their lives, perhaps when. You know, that fluid intelligence, being able to react in the moment is starting to tail off a little bit. But we discount the accumulated wisdom that we've had, that we've accumulated, that we've brought up in our lives. We've added up and, and we, we don't tend to value that as high as this kind of nimbleness, perhaps, that we've counted upon, that we've drawn upon in the, in the, uh, in the previous part of our careers. Yeah, and I think in the article um, uh, they, he cites some research which is about two different types of intelligence, and he talks about fluid intelligence, which is something that uh, really is present in our earlier lives, which is that we're you know much more quick thinking, lots of reasoning, analysis, and solving problems. Whereas as we get older, we accumulate that value, and it, and, um, it comes what they call crystallized intelligence, and therefore. Um, we still, as we're older, and I can speak for myself here, you know, I kind of, in my mind, I'm still 27, mm. uh, and, um, but I'm not, but I still think I am, but mm. I can't think and act the way that I could then. And it's that, uh, starting to appreciate that actually what you have as you get older is as valuable as long as you realize it for what it is. It's just a different sort of contribution, a different sort of, um, uh, relevance that you place professionally but I still think that we are judged um, as we get older against the um, kind of the sharpness and the go-getting if you like of, of younger people and uh, as we get older we've kind of professionally seen as something that is not as valuable but actually the value comes in a very different way and I think that this is something that we need to appreciate more and both in ourselves and also um, if we're leading teams and organizations to appreciate that as well. And I'm not sure we do entirely all the time. No, I think you're right. And I think the key thing here that we're hitting upon is that sometimes it's not just others who judge us. It's we judge ourselves negatively in comparison to our earlier selves, rather than perhaps seeing us as different, rather than, you know, worse or in somehow not able as able, but we're able in different ways. Exactly. Yeah. And I think it's the able in different ways that um, is so important when it comes to uh, self-leadership is that, you know, we have to have our own markers for self-worth uh, and um, and those will change over time. But if we we stay with the markers that might have made us successful at one age or in one career, 
um, then we can kind of tear ourselves apart by thinking, well, I'm not like that anymore, therefore I can't be good enough, when in fact actually uh, it's actually appreciating what those new things are. Yeah, I've got a few quotes here that I wouldn't mind um, us discussing, but there's one here that's particularly relevant around not just who we were in the past, but the different parts of ourselves in the here and now. So here's one. So this is the author speaking. So recently I asked Dominique Dawes, a former Olympic gold medal gymnast, how normal life felt after competing and winning at the highest levels. She told me that she is happy, but the adjustment wasn't easy and still isn't, even though she won her last Olympic medal in 2000. My Olympic self would ruin my marriage and leave my kids feeling inadequate, she told me, because it is so demanding and hard driving. Living life as if every day is an Olympics only makes others around me miserable. So it made me think, what is your sense of self-worth and where do you draw that from? And if your professional life is your only source of self-worth, then that's a fairly precarious position to put yourself in, all your eggs in that basket, so to speak. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and there's there's the whole notion that uh, um, people talk about having a work-life balance in order that you can see uh, not just yourself, but experience the way you live, uh, something other than work. I mean, certainly the people I work with, you know, they're, um, you know, highly successful professionals, but uh, the, the, their work is what dominates their life and therefore they they have nothing else to judge themselves by. Um, and also, um, yeah, they, the impact that it has on, on other people um, sometimes uh, changing things around comes too late, whereas uh, the notion of work-life balance and the being able to incorporate both work and life and other things is that it kind of evens evens out. But, um, yeah, I thought that, that quote was fascinating. Uh, I mean, an Olympian is, you know, pretty extraordinary in their elite athletes, but I think it, there's a little bit of applies to all of us in lots of different ways. Yeah, absolutely, and I think you're right. In terms of the Olympian, you get this kind of picture in your head, and it seems true from what I've read, is that there is a self-obsession around really just trying to push yourself and your boundaries, and I think that quote, what it highlights for me is that actually life is relational, and you know, in, in relation to yourself as well, you know, this would make my life miserable, my marriage miserable, others miserable, it would make me miserable if I live my life in this way. It's very different to how I approach the accomplishment that I'm trying to get to as an Olympian. And I think the other thing here is um, that's worth noting here is that depending upon the field of work that we're in, that we may judge ourselves and our professional decline very differently. So here's the other quote that I was thinking about. In some professions, early decline is inescapable. No one expects an Olympic athlete to remain competitive until age 60. But in many physically non-demanding occupations, we implicitly reject the inevitability of decline before very old age. Sure, our quads and our hamstrings may weaken a little with age, but as long as we retain our marbles, our quality of work as a writer, lawyer, executive, or entrepreneur should stay high right up until the very end, right? And many people think so. I recently met a man a bit older than I am who told me he planned to push it until the wheels came off. In effect, he planned to stay at the very top of his game by any means necessary and then keel over. But the odds are that he won't be able to. The data are shockingly clear that for most people in most fields, decline starts earlier than almost anyone thinks. And the author goes on to give several examples of this. So the question is for me then, and for you, I'd be interested to hear your view on this, is that if our professional decline starts earlier than we think it does, how do we protect ourselves from the effects? And also, how do we manage our professional decline? Because I don't know about you, but I've never walked through a bookshop and found a section saying how to manage your professional decline. It's just bang, retirement, and you're off a cliff edge, and you're expected to sort it out. Yeah, it is. Uh, um uh, I, reading this and listening to that quote being read out again, it, it kind of still sends the shivers down my back in a, in a sense of nobody wants to feel that actually you're in decline at all. But the truth of it is, is that as humans, we're either growing or we're dying. Um, what I always say to people when it comes to uh, to actually continuing to develop, and it, and it isn't necessarily about always trying to push for that peak performance 
as you said in that uh, person who's given us an example, you know, you keep keep going and try to work at that peak. But it's about finding new growth curves, finding new ways to develop and feel that you can be at your peak. But it, but it may be in a different a different way. So often, um, if you can kind of imagine, you know, the bell curve that goes right at that, you're growing and then you come down and you're in this point of decline, which is where that article photograph and that article started. Mm. Whereas I like to try and get people think about more like S curves. So you're kind of going to a point, you get to a peak and it's like, well, you need to find a new place to go because otherwise the natural way is down. Yeah. So it's actually thinking, well, I've got so far. How does it feel? And where do I find that new growth? Because I think even though all this research, uh, which chills me to the bone to know that this is what happens, is that the way you can try to mitigate this is to find other ways to grow personally. And this is what personal leadership is about, is finding that new kind of area to grow in. Now, it may be to upskill in learning something new about the field you're in, or it could be moving to a different field or a different job or completely changing what you're doing. But I think it is this notion of looking for these S curves as opposed to the bell curves that take us into decline. That's the way I like to think about it. Yeah, anyway. I think you're definitely onto something in terms of thinking about this differently and not necessarily being trapped by the way that we're thinking about careers or the way that we see these things playing out for people. My friends who are new me at school and at college tease me as to whether I'm onto my eighth or ninth career at the moment. Um, and I think the quote here from this article that really sung out to me was towards the end is what I need to do in effect is stop seeing my life as a canvas to fill and start seeing it more as a block of marble to chip away at and to shape something out of. I need a reverse bucket list. My goal for each year for the rest of my life should be to throw out things, obligations and relationships until I can clearly see my refined self in its best form. And then the author talks about his conversation also about how we perhaps neglect our spiritual development to prepare us for this stage in our life. So he kind of outlines this kind of Hindu way of thinking about the world. The first stage is about learning in our youth. Secondly comes the stage where we build our careers, we accumulate wealth, we raise families. But the third stage is where we purposefully focus less on professional ambition and more on aspects of spirituality, service and wisdom. And it feels like currently our, the way we think about our professional careers, not the model that you just set out, but this kind of U-shaped curve, it feels like that it ill prepares us for that. And we think that somehow extending this second stage of career and accumulation is the way that brings us fulfillment and contentment. And perhaps it isn't. Yeah, it's fascinating, isn't it? I mean, I, um, I'm still trying to wrap my head around this because, and I think that's probably uh, maybe a bit of a reflection that um, still in my psyche, it's kind of like, you still have to go, 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 whatever your age, um, as opposed to what this is suggesting is, which is that, um, you know, there is a time in life when you you do appreciate, um, you know, you are carving out, as you say, or looking for the spirituality. Um, I think the thing that I notice is that, and it'll be really interesting, I think, because what I'm noticing um, with people who I'm working with at the moment, you know, they're kind of in their 20s, is that they're looking for this kind of spiritual edge now rather than later. So um, I don't know how this model is going to play out into the, into, uh, into the future. But definitely, um, what becomes um, very uh, frequent in conversations with people I work with is that what is important to them? Where is this meaning? People don't often talk about spirituality, but it's just another way of, uh, of putting it, is what makes them happy? Where do they feel like they are able to contribute? Where are they feeling like they are paying something back um, and able to give either in time of service or experience? That's really, really common um, with people who, you know, past 50, as it were. And I think that... Um, you know, this is a modern phenomenon for, for people, you know, in, in years gone by, we never lived this long. Um, so mm. uh, now I think we're really going to have to work at it. So maybe this is going to be the next boom in, in kind of leadership and personal development and self-help is that uh, maybe some more books about how do you really uh, engage with this whole uh, process of, of, uh, of this stage of life.
Yeah, I'm not sure professional decline is the way to sell it, but there may be another way of des des describing it. But it's interesting. I guess the author goes on and finishes off in the article. And I do recommend you have a look at it because I think, you know, it's a little bit dense, but it's well worth kind of like trying to digest and pick apart and see what you get from it. But at, towards the end, he suggests four commitments that he's going to make to help him to map out the remaining years of his life, not just his professional life, but his life. And he mentioned, like I said before, he was 51 when he wrote the article. So the first one was to jump. And what he meant by that was to walk away from projects and accomplishments on your own terms, perhaps before you're completely ready to. The second one is something that you've mentioned is this idea about being able to serve. And that's being able to perhaps teach or mentor as a way of sharing the wisdom that we perhaps have accumulated in our lives and our experience up to that point. The third one, again, you've mentioned this, is to develop spiritually, to find greater meaning in life. And finally, to connect and to focus on the health of his relationships as he feels that the secret to bearing his decline, it's interesting his language, bearing his decline, is to become more conscious of the roots linking him to others. And I guess as you're talking, I'm thinking that this doesn't need to be reserved for when you're 50 plus. This seems to me to be like a really good roadmap to be thinking about as you go through your career right from the very start. As you say, there's, there's a hunger out there in people in their 20s who are looking for this kind of direction and meaning absolutely definitely and I, and I think that um you know it's one of the things that inspires me and I kind of really admire about uh some of the uh kind of entrepreneurs who are in their uh, predominantly in their 20s and 30s that are actually going out on these entrepreneurial journeys but they're not going out in it to really go for fame and fortune they're actually in it to be able to make the impact in the world and I think that there's a lesson there for all of us uh, in doing that is that um, at any age you can embrace actually what is important and what is meaningful to you. And also um, uh, to be more kind of like enlightened citizens of the world, if you like, which um, which is where the service uh, aspect comes in for mm. me. So many people, they work, work, work professionally, all of a sudden they feel, OK, now I have time to make a difference in the world as opposed to what I'm noticing is that, you know, millennials or whatever, you know, my, you might want to uh, call them, is that they're looking to make that difference at the beginning of their careers, not not halfway through or towards the end. Mm. Um, you know, and this whole notion of retirement, I think, which we haven't got into and is not necessarily further in the article, but I think it is that one of those things is like, you know, who's going to retire these days or in the future? Um, partly that work uh, will require people to work for longer, um, but also it's one of those ways that you can continue to to, um, to feel useful and meaningful and relevant in the world. So, yeah, it's fascinating. But I think it ultimately um, some of these things are emotional triggers in, in ours, but if we don't respond to them and do something with them um, by, you know, creating ways of, thinking differently and doing things differently, that's when the psychological decline can um, can kick in if you ignore it. One of the points that he makes, I think you're right, in terms of the, the emotional triggers. And one of the things that he talks about in this article, particularly towards the end, is the idea of death. And the idea is, as we approach the, towards the end of our lives, these questions become more meaningful for us, thinking about our legacy and what is it that we want to do and how is it that we want to go out? Do we want to wane or do we want to go out shining like a star? And thinking about different ways to shine then, I think, then becomes the key to unlocking that. And I think that what you're saying also is that perhaps the benchmark by which we define success is different from the kind of the boomers to perhaps the people who are coming up through their careers now. How do we measure whether we've been successful? How do we measure happiness? Big questions, but I think that they're up for discussion now. Oh, definitely. And I think that certainly, uh, you know, in, in kind of workplaces of all kinds, there are things, you know, the whole engagement question of how, how do you keep people motivated? And, and ultimately it is down to, are people feeling happy at work? Um, and I guess this conversation is kind of really highlighted is how that happiness changes over time and what we can do to help ourselves in that process. Um, but it also raises the question is, what do we expect our workplaces to do for us to help us to get there as well? Hmm. 
Hey, thanks, Julie. It's been brilliant talking with you again today. If you've made it this far when you're watching, thanks for staying with us. Please let us know in the comments about what you thought, about what resonated for you. What did you agree with? What did you disagree with? Do you have any tips who, for anybody who finds themselves wondering how to manage their careers once they move on from what feels like a fulfilled mission to start a new one, perhaps later on in their careers or perhaps earlier on? Have you done this yourself? And how did you manage it? How do you continue to manage that? And we'd love to hear your stories. So I'll leave you with a final quote from the article. I'd be interested, Julie, what you, this sparks for you. The biggest mistake professionally successful people make is attempting to sustain peak accomplishment indefinitely. What, what struck you about that? Yeah, that was one of the, the, the um, quotes in the article. I, it really kind of hit a chord with me. I always have seen myself as a bit of a high achiever, as it were, professionally. But I think uh, the point that he makes uh, for me is an important one is that, A, um, you know, the research tells us that if you try to do that, you're going to be sadly disappointed. But I think also uh, the thing that I kind of take out of it is I'm always looking to make that shift. So what I was successful in and where I see things previously might not be where I see the, fu uh, the future being held. But I think that the more people can think about what those measures and markers of success are at any stage of life is, well, ultimately will leave you to be happier. Thanks, Julie. And thanks again for being on the show again. It's been really good yeah. having you here. Yeah, it's a great conversation. Thanks very much. And we hope to be back again soon. Thanks again for joining us. See you again.